idea of how this spin revolve into the grail cup, the perfect turning inside out nest we talked about. It seems to have no inside or outside. And yet we're seeing this is created directly from this experience of perfect nesting, embedding, compression. The grail cup, a Sufi heart with wings, feminine reproductive organs. But in this zoom, instead of morphing into a fractal, we're gonna morph into actually how stars this is a NASA photograph now of the collision of major star system. And we see that if you actually zoom in to that center grail cup of the angel wings star cup grail formation, that it's actually a fetus, which actually has a black hole in the center. Alchemy means from the blackness. So something is squirting in there that requires this embedding. Okay. So that's just a very suggestive, almost poetic little visualization that indicates to us that when we get very still and we have a great deal of charge density, which may in fact relate to the phenomena of bliss radiating from the heart like a, like a snake charmer in a dance, that at those moments when the harmonics, what I call concress, that there is the beginning of a little worming ability that occurs that enables you to literally steer into stars. Now at first, that sounds like a fairy tale, even in, this, in the serious mystery and serious connection books. The authors say, well, when the Egyptians said, in order to get out of here, you needed to be able to ride on the boat through the heart of the sun, they said, oh, that's not real physics. But I've actually come to believe that the nature of the way the electrical field of the heart at these moments when it turns inside out so effectively, it creates this, it looks like a pine cone, but it's literally a screwing action which takes the wave that was inside you and allows it to embed or fold itself into the wave nest of what was outside you. So at first you could visualize, you light this little fire in your heart the implosion begins, you steer the fire around just like you would steer the attention around inside your body and you could feel the tingle even in your little finger when you place your attention in your little finger. If you move your attention there with lots of focus, you can feel a presence begin to grow around wherever it is you placed your attention. The placement of attention creates the still point around which then charge waves begin to grow, like a, a nest inside a nest, like a donut inside a donut. And so the tingle you feel may literally be simply the result of the choice of the placement of stillness, which then aligns the wave nodes and begins the sorting of field effects, which eventually results in this tingling or presence or feeling. So moving attention appears to be the ability to move this center of electrical implosion. And ultimately, we're coming to understand that the very nature of gravity itself is likely usefully described as when charge waves arrange themselves in exactly that self-similar or fractal quality. So essentially, we could say, the reason you have gravity in an atom is because the nucleus is self-similar to the electron shells. As a result, the cascade inward can continue and you get this wind of charge towards center, which we have called gravity. Now you say, well, gee, uh, I wanted to watch a little film on the nature of DNA and the nature of consciousness. Why is someone trying to teach me the fundamental physics of a new theory of gravity? Well, the reason is rather simple. First of all, I believe that unless you can make your own gravity, you will be ultimately blown away in the magnetic wind of the sun. And we have lots of poetry about how emotions create centering force. And uh, you know, you have butterflies in your stomach because you're not grounded, you're not embedded. So all of the poetry suggests, in fact, gravity has everything to do with emotion. What I'm su suggesting is we make this explicit in our physics and understand that gravity or centering force, G ray of Vita, is produced when we learn the skill 
of assembling this fire in the heart. And ultimately, you see, then we can make the centering force that allows our glandular emotions to steer its way as a wave function into the centers of gravity of not just the body or the planet, but the sun and ultimately the stars. I personally have hundreds or at least dozens of friends who very explicitly tell me stories. One of them is right here with us now. And she tells us these great stories about what it is to see through the heart of the sun and travel. And more and more friends are able to do this, and they're quite vivid and explicit about it. And I would suggest to our physicists that we can no longer ignore this phenomena of the ability to be able to see your way through the sun because it is a clue to what I believe is ultimately the way in which our collective genetic memory has a way to be harvested, has a way to travel into stars. If you remember in, in Starseed Transmissions at the end, you see this, you know, it's Ken Carey's book, you see this blue fire aura around the planet come to be self-organizing enough, and then it appears to detach from the planet and sail through the sun into stars. The Templar name for those who could enter the sun was called solarions, solar eon, or they called them varicoca, the clear ones. The Anunnaki were a story of those ans who could travel through the sun, the solar logos, the solar beings. Every myth that, if we look deep enough, informs us that the ability to enter and inhabit the sun is the key to the way in and out of the gravity field of the solar system. This makes physical sense, and now I would like to understand that if we understand I'd like to suggest that if we understand the nature of glandular emotion making implosion, we can understand this in electrical terms. So to make this story kind of more fun and bring it closer to home, I'm going to now weave a little bit of a fairy tale, which is based in large part on some scholarship. The scholarship touches on uh, Zachariah Sitchin's stories of the Sumerian tablets, uh, the Sumerian tablets as enunciated in his books uh, 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 Genesis Revisited and um, uh, the many books, uh, uh, let's see, what were the other books of Zachariah Sitchin? Uh, Twelfth Planet, thank you very much. And so he has looked at the origins of Egyptian and the origins of the Bible and found them to be largely fairly poor translations of the Sumerian tablets. And looking closely at the Sumerian tablets, he's come to believe that these are stories of the arrival of an extraterrestrial family aboard an artificial gene-splicing planetoid called Nibiru. And the group were called the Anunnaki because they were in the, in the descendants of An, uh, or Ea, E-A, for whom I believe Earth was named. And this word for An, for example, became the word for God in many languages, including the story of Tuatha, Tuatha de Danan, D-A-N-A-N, -A -A uh, from the Celtic, which literally means people of the gods, and even our Danube River, D-A-N, uh, and my name, Dan, all meant in the lineage of An, of the Anunnaki. So this word for being present with the gods is very, um, it's pervasive in our, our historical myths. So there's probably some truth to this scholarship on the Sumerian origins of our culture, which suggests an extraterrestrial origin. Now, I'd like to, to hint that there may be some great um, genetic meaning about the origin of what I'm calling ensoulment, or getting a soul, in the DNA when this implosion happens. In what was described in the um, Sumerian tablets and even in the Bible as what it meant to fall, as in the fallen ones, or uh, Lucifer, or more particularly Nephilim, or the order of the Nephites, which was transliterated literally as the fallen ones. 